first of all, let me introduce to you right next to me is James Allen, who is a professor in the Department of Geography at Cal State University in Northridge. Uh, he received his PhD at Syracuse, Syracuse University and has taught at uh, CSUN for a long time. Want me to tell him how long? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> taught, taught there for a long time. Uh, he's got a great book that I've used in class before called The Ethnic Quilt, Population Diversity in Southern California. Uh, he's also had uh, other books that really use and, and talk about the uh, uh, demographic shift and use all kinds of great maps and, uh, and distributes uh, ethnic communities from uh, throughout the United States and in Southern California. So th thanks, uh, Jim, for, for coming. Um, next we have, uh, let me introduce Dal Myers, who is a professor over at USC. And he's done some uh, great work. Uh, he's a professor of urban planning and demography in the School of Policy, Planning, and Development. Uh, he's the chair of the school's faculty council and directs the school's population dynamic research group. Uh, I've known Dal uh, for uh, a while, always liked his work. And in to, uh, this Sunday's LA Times, there was an article that references his, his work. So it wasn't an article that he wrote. He wasn't the one commenting or being the analyst, but he was the subject of somebody's editorial talking about the type of work that he's done and how Im important this work is. And it was in the opinion section of uh, Sunday's LA Time. Interesting, last week we had Ruben Martinez here and his, uh, he had written a, uh, an editorial the week before in the Sunday Times. So I'm showing you how contemporary these people are, that it's not only the academic work or the films or what they do, but it's uh, uh, being covered by the LA Times every week before we, uh, uh, we get to class. So Dal Myers from uh, USC. Um, also joining us, who's just arrived, uh, is uh, Eric Avila, who's a uh, associate professor over at UCLA. He's uh, um, the author of a, a, a great book that I'm currently using in class and some of the students have out, out there. Uh, it's Popular Culture in the Age of White Flight, Fear and Fantasy in Suburban Los Angeles. Uh, and uh, uh, Eric, thank you for uh, uh, joining us. Um, next to Dow is uh, a, a colleague uh, here at LMU at the, uh, in, in the history department who has just joined us and we're very proud to have him and lucky to have more people who are now teaching and talking about Los Angeles at, at this uh, university. He earned his PhD at, uh, at UCLA and he's currently working on a, a work project that we're going to ask him about, Reimagining Indian Country, American Indians and Cities in Modern America. It's uh, a subject matter that's very important and we hardly ever, ever uh, uh, talk about that. And um, uh, last but certainly not least is a, a colleague that uh, I've, you know, ha have seen her work but have never had the pleasure of uh, uh, of meeting her and, and, and talking to her. And I think we're gonna start uh, with, uh, with Sarah and, and ask her um, what her work is about, how she started studying LA, and when you talk, in, what are the type of classes that you teach at, in, in, when you start talking about LA? What are, you, what are you teaching right now? What class are you teaching right now about LA? Oh, well, actually, currently I'm teaching a class on art and popular culture for graduate students. So it's actually looking at cultural theory and granny. They can handle, these are Loyola Marymount students. They're like graduate students. So they, <laughs> you know, in part, sometimes I like to introduce the panel, but I should also introduce who's out there. Um, these are mostly juniors and seniors, uh, and they are in three different classes that uh, all, all have the L.A. theme. One of them is L.A. politics, the other one is uh, uh, from urban studies, and the other one is public policy in political science. And we get together every other week to talk uh, in common, some common themes. First, we met for about half an hour with the, our respective classes, and th this is who, th who they are. So, uh, again, they're Loyola Marymount University students. I think they can ha handle graduate level work. So, w tell me a little bit more about the, the type of research that you, <laughs> you've been doing. Um, okay, I certainly will. Um, my re historical interest in Los Angeles, um, when I was a graduate student and now that I'm a, a professor and a professional academic, and the research I've been preoccupied with for the past decade or so um, has tried to show how civic identity, the idea that residents of a specific urban geography 
experience a sense of belonging or membership to that place. So this notion of a civic um, belonging, how this has served to galvanize the powerful, but also become a tool of the disempowered. And my inspiration for wanting to study civic culture and civic identity came directly from a footnote in Mike Davis's City of Courts, which I read, I think, like the second week I was in grad I started graduate school at UC San Diego. And I came across a reference to an art um, controversy involving conservative artists who red baited or accused other artists of becoming of being communists and disliking the type of representations of the city in their artwork, which led to the city of Los Angeles banning modernist painting from any public space in the city in 1951. And it was upheld for several months before it was finally fought out in the courts. And so I was really interested in like how did these people you know, why were they investing so much in art in this way? And what kind of power did this hold for a broader urban politic? And so that's how I got involved in this question of civic and civic identity. I don't know if you want me to continue. No, so in 1951, the city council or the county board of supervisors? It was the city council. Outlawed modernist art. Yes, from any public space, they would not pay for any or sponsor any art show that involved abstract expressionism. And so, is this what, so what did you write your dissertation on? Um, I wrote it on the art in the city, on basically the politics of modernism and modernist art in Los Angeles between 1900 and 1965. And so bring us up to speed a little bit since 1965. What's the, is there a policy, is there a city policy on art? Um, there are a lot of city policies <laughs> on art. Um, we have a municipal art department, which is now the Cultural Affairs Department, mm -hmm. and it's housed actually at Barnsdale Art Park, and which some of you maybe have taken art classes there um, as kids. And they're basically the public art center of the city of Los Angeles, and it's quite a progressive um, institution, but it had, was a hard fought for feature of, America, um, of Los Angeles cultural politics starting in the early 1950s. Isn't there also a law in terms of development that if you uh, have a a certain percentage of, of a fee has to go to develop art? It's a percent per art program, and those started in the 1970s in other cities across the, the nation, but Los Angeles has one too. Have, have you taken a, how effective has that been? Um, in the 1980s, it was very effective. That's when you get plop art. And do you know what plop art is? <laughs> Can you imagine? It's when you get sort of giant corporate paid for pieces of art that get kind of plopped down literally um, in a public space. And frequently those become quite controversial because people who might use that space, like workers um, or employees in an office building, may feel quite alienated from a space they might have used to eat their lunch or get some rays of sunshine you know, in between their work day. And so plop art tended to be one of the offshoots of the percent for art program, as opposed to it actually being used to support community art projects. And one of the big problems in Los Angeles currently is that many community art centers, like the Watts Towers Art Center, um, are terribly underfunded because so much energy goes into sort of corporate displays of civic power. And um, when you think of this plot, uh, is there any type of public art that you, you've seen that you might consider plot art but you kind of like? Um, no. <laughs> not, not a single piece. Um, well, I like different types of art that communities produce and that become representative of those. So for example, I love Spark, um, which is Judy Baca Center in Venice. Which is very close by here. Yes, which I highly recommend if any of you have art projects to do with cultural production or community art projects to check out Judy Baca's archive. It is actually in an old prison, um, a, a jail, jail. Uh, um, in, um, in Venice. And she has an amazing archive since the 1970s of slides of murals and community art projects that young people have been participating in for the last 30, 35 years now, actually. So, um, that's a, so that type of art that's sort of from the ground up is the type I enjoy. Um, so in this enjoy class that you're teaching, what are like the, at the end of the day, if you were to run into a student from five years from now, what are the two or three things that you would want them to remember? Um, the Watts Towers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they always do. And to realize that you can be empowered through cultural practice. And, and, that's, and so when my students sort of take that upon themselves and maybe get involved with museum work and um, public art and realize that there are relationships between how aesthetics can be used politically and how their daily life is experienced. I think that I've really done my job. Jim, you started uh, studying LA when? In uh, 1988 or so, 
we had uh, published a book dealing with the whole United States, and my co-author and I were still talking to each other. You know, that often doesn't happen. And well, tell so, the students why, because you start working too close together. Yeah, working too close to together. It's you kind get of like a little when, tense at times. It's kind of like when we put you guys together in a work, uh, in a group assignment, and you have to do a group assignment, and you always feel that someone's doing more work than the other, et cetera. And then philosophically, I like the idea, I'm a geographer, and I teach in a geography department, and uh, I like the idea of some people in the geography departments uh, specializing in the local area, whatever area it was. So we decided we'd turn our attention to L.A., and for the next few years, I talked to everyone I could. I read everything I could on L.A. just to try to begin to, to understand it. And do you recall what the best piece was that you, when you first started looking at L.A. that you read that you thought, uh, this is probably well, does, does it the best? I thought Mike Davis's book, The City of Courts, really turned me on. Uh, it had to do with political processes and, and power struggles in L.A. Uh, some of my students don't care for it. They see it as quite a negative book. Uh, but I saw it was a powerful book in, in terms of political explanation. And what is the first uh, um, piece on L.A. that you wrote? Well, uh, we did a research article in a journal called uh, Spatial Patterns of Immigrant Assimilation. And that's, that's an, a very tell analytical what, article. Yeah, tell them what spatial patterns. Well, spatial patterns have to do with the, the horizontal patterns of, of, uh, of geographical patterns over, over place. And what we were looking at, what we were testing out, is the old model developed from the Chicago School of Sociology uh, that said people, when, they, uh, when immigrants arrive in a, a city such as Chicago back in the early 20th century and L.A. Uh, in the last 30 or 40 years, they tend to cluster together and they tend to be poor. And then as they learn English language better, they get acquainted with the, the particular culture then they, uh, and get some job skills. They are able, if they wish, to move out of those concentrations, which tend to be in poor areas. And so we tested that out in Los Angeles and found that although there's a lot of noise in the results, it's generally true. It wasn't quite so true for Mexicans and Armenians. We had certain exceptions, but, but it was generally valid to some extent. And what are the groups that you were talking about? Give oh, us some we idea of where they would come in and what would happen to okay, them. Okay, we were looking at uh, about 16 or 17 groups of Mexicans, uh, Salvadorans, Guatemalans. Uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese, Filipino, Armenians, um, people from Iran. Uh, I forget, there's a total of 16 or 17. And, and the way we did our analysis was to identify certain pumas that, that, that are large areas in which we can get detailed uh, understanding of the people who live there, uh, areas that uh, represented concentrations, residential concentrations of the group. And then we found uh, we formed two other areas further out that represent the zones of dispersal. And then we looked at the characteristics of the people in the zones of concentration as opposed to the zones of the next immediate dispersal zone and then the, the ones further out, which would be San Bernardino, Riverside County, Southern Orange County, okay, places so like that. Why do Armenians first go to Montebello and then end up in Glendale? Well, they don't. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, what happens? Uh, Arme Armenians are an old ethnic population in L.A. Came here over 100 years ago, some of them settling in downtown. And then after that, some of them moved to Pasadena. And if you go to the corner of Allen and I forget the street in East Pasadena, you'll see some of the Armenian shops, not the same owners perhaps, but possibly the same owners who settled there in 1902, that same corner over 100 years ago. And the Montebello ones, that, that settlement started uh, either just before or after World War II, people out mi migrating from the ethnically diverse East Los Angeles area, and then joined by people coming in from the, the uh, Soviet Union and uh, other places like that. So that has its own distinctive history. And we also see, for instance, Jews in Los Angeles were first in Boyle Heights, then in Fairfax, and then in Sherman Oaks. And is it the same people, or what's happening with yeah. that? Well, Jews were much earlier uh, in the 19th century. Harris Newmark and other, uh, first of all, German Jews coming in before the Eastern European Jews. But what's best known, and I think it's best publicized, and a lot been written on it, is the Eastern European Jews coming in in the 1920s and 1930s and often settling in Boyle Heights. Uh, and that was a big part of the ethnic diversity there. 
uh, and then later on moving. There are hardly any Jews left in, in the Boyle Heights area. In fact, I think the last store that used to be Jewish owned was sold, sold to a Korean immigrant. I don't think there's anything left there, but you've got the old Jewish shul on uh, Bridge Street. and So you've got evidences on the landscape of this sort of thing. But most Jews have been moving to the West. And the leading Jewish demographer of Jews in LA, who, who is Bruce Phillips at the Hebrew Union, uh, by his data, which is based on a random digit dialing uh, telephone survey of, of all people living throughout LA, finds that the section that is the most Jewish in being the highest percentage Jewish today is a section of Studio City, Toluca Lake, uh, uh, right on the north side of the Santa Monica Mountains. No longer Pico Robertson, no longer Fairfax. Those are the older areas that used to have higher percentage of Jews. So people are moving around. Is it harder to study LA than Chicago or New York? I mean, from what you can tell from colleagues who do, do uh, focus on those other cities? Uh, I think there are more scholars studying Los Angeles than any other city in the United States, certainly more than San Francisco, although Chicago uh, was a center of, of research. It's not so much today. And there's a large, uh, it's a smaller group in studying the greater New York area. Yeah, I, I think it's a smaller group. But that wasn't always the case. I mean, you talk about Mike Davis, it's tough to find I mean, we can find many books before my name, but not to the degree, the proliferation of books that we see now. Oh, that's right. I was answering your question yeah. in the present right, day. Right, uh, right. Yeah, since in the 1990s, and Ed Soja at, at UCLA, and uh, his article that came out on, uh, in uh, economic geography in 1983 um, began to set the tone of research uh, on, on modern LA. Yeah. Hey, Dal, when did you start studying LA? I can't remember. <laughs> you don't, there wasn't a moment when you read a footnote in Mike Davis or? No, that's a pretty good story, Jim. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that you would point that out. No, I, 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 you know, must have, well, I moved here in uh, fall of 88, so it wasn't before then, I know that. But I probably, I waited till the 1990s census came out. And at that point, I started looking at census data about changes in LA. And then we discovered a whole lot was happening. And so what were you working on before? Well, I've had a very checkered history. You're a professor. You can't have a checkered history. Oh, well, like... I, I, I even taught in a business school. That's checkered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, and I started off uh, in urban planning, but I was always interested in population changes in, uh, in the cities. I started off at Berkeley, and then I went to MIT. Uh, well, actually, I started off in New York. I guess I should start there, really. And there I was looking at uh, the, the process of trying to integrate neighborhoods. They were moving public housing. Uh, they called it scatter site housing, moving it from concentrated areas out into more middle class neighborhoods. And so basically, I kind of gave Mario Cuomo his start in his career. <laughs> at least I was. Well, tell some of the students who Mario Cuomo is, because I think when he left politics, most of them were still uh, alive. That's too bad. They wouldn't know. Mario Cuomo is former governor of uh, New York State and was a big leader of the Democratic Party on the liberal side. Uh, and could have been president, except that he was too much of a New Yorker. And he couldn't get elected. What is that? What's a New Yorker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, he couldn't get elected in the Sun Belt, basically, and in the West. So I think that held him back. And his son is currently, what, attorney general in New York, I think. Um, he was former uh, deputy uh, secretary of HUD as well. Right. Uh, anyhow, um, Cuomo was a lawyer, and he got involved in this big dispute in Forest Hills, it was called. And the Forest Hills community was resisting this. It was like a 12-story apartment building you're going to put in their neighborhood. And Forest Hills is where the tennis tournament is. It has sort of a middle class, upper middle class um, flavor to it. And they didn't want to have this big public housing project foisted upon them because it had been rejected previously by some people. Neighboring community, it was Italians, had rejected it. And so this is a more of a Jewish area. And they thought they were being picked upon. I was actually in anthropology at that time. Mm -hmm. And I wrote a paper for Margaret Mead on this case. And I went out there studying this when it was happening. And I remember one little old lady, uh, she wasn't that old, she's probably younger than me now. But she seemed old to me as a college kid. She must have been like 45, 50. And she sort of shook her finger and said, you know, you Columbia kids, you know, we used to riot against the war. You Columbia kids, you show us how to do it. You show us how to do it. <laughs> Because they were like laying down in front of bulldozers and doing all kinds of stuff. So I thought it was pretty exciting. Uh, 
And there was a lot of big issues. Well, that was the right way to do it, put a big housing project out there. In the so community. did it get built? Uh, it got, well, Cuomo came along then on my coattails. Right? I'm, a, I'm a senior in college, and he's writing my coattails. I felt he wrote a book called Forest Hills Diary that really was describing the start of his career. And he negotiated a settlement. So basically, they cut the, the building in half down to, um, I think, six stories. Or is it from 24 down to 12 stories? This is New York, mind you. So they're big, they think big. And then it was only going to be eligible for people who were veterans or the elderly. And that's how they finally sold it to the community on, on that basis. Yeah, so what brought you out to uh, LA, USC? Uh, yeah, I, I got the call to come out to USC, and I, it was a chance for me to work on urban planning issues and other broader things integrated. And so I was like out here, and I was afraid when I first came out. I didn't know how I could come to. Wait, I, wait, 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 you're from New York, and you're afraid of LA? <clears throat> well, but I, see, I'd never driven a car really. <laughs> And I, you know, no, that's really foreign to the people, <laughs> I mean, students here, you think about Well, I mean, I drove a car, but I never commuted in heavy traffic, and the idea, I, I said to people, I couldn't come to any meetings before 11 a.m., because <laughs> I, and they started making me come to 9 a.m. meetings and get into the traffic. That's like students, but they have different reasons why they don't want to commute until 11 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have a new colleague now who's from New York, and she's the same way, actually. Exact same way. She's a, she won't drive on a freeway at all. So what's the first article you wrote about L.A.? <clears throat> It's probably my uh, paper on overcrowded housing, because one of the big things that changed in 1990 was we had an explosion in overcrowding, and no one knew what was going on, because I was a housing expert, and overcrowding had been getting better in America ever since World War II. It almost disappeared. It was off the radar screen, and in L.A., it just shot back up between 1980 and 1990, and the smoking gun pointed towards immigration being about it, so we started studying that with our census data and found all these paradoxes and complex <laughs> patterns. We couldn't figure out what was going on and it forced us to do more and more elaborate analysis and then we realized that we were deep into immigration. Mm -hmm. then, I, then, after doing the research, this is all backwards, then I started studying the literature to see what did the scholars say about immigration. Mm -hmm. And I realized they didn't know anything about what we were doing here. And the, the literature wasn't oriented towards the, the problems in LA. And so then I had to try to figure out how do I reform this literature. The problem is they didn't want to be reformed. You know, all these other scholars were banding together doing their thing. It was more Chicago, New York, East Coast. And they just didn't understand Los Angeles. Turns out Los Angeles was having immigration um, grow rapidly much earlier than those other parts of the country. And so the other parts were really oriented towards the old immigration from 1920 or before. And they had theories that were really either based there or based in Miami, which I had a small advantage because uh, in, in doing this, I could sort of dip into my reservoir of, uh, of tricks. And I was born in Miami. And so I knew a lot about Miami before Cubans, before Castro, and, and after Cubans. And, and so I had some orientation that way. But, but the Cuban experience was totally unlike the Mexican-American experience. And so still we didn't know anything about LA. So I started looking more and more into it, motivated by the, the I thought, the faulty work of other scholars. Now, the, the people who were looking at urban issues in LA, they weren't looking at immigration at all. That's a separate group of people. Mm -hmm. They're more geographers and cultural critics, um, some political types. I don't know what you call Mike Davis exactly. And he's all of those. By the way, way, Mike Davis's use of census data is really excellent. I mean, every time I read his census data, I'm impressed. He never exaggerates. He never distorts. He really uses the numbers very correctly. Now, you say that because he's been criticized for distorting data. He, he's been faulted for giving, yeah, well, not data, but sort of facts. Uh -huh. But usually people, everybody I know, even the scholars, they distort the data. And he never has distorted it. So I always thought that interesting paradox, and I pull that to journalists whenever they quiz me about Mike Davis, and they always ignore my point, because my point doesn't fit their story, and so they ignore it. That's a, that's a lesson about journalism. They want to hear evidence for what they want to write. Well, kind of like what you started out, though. You had evidence, and then you had to go back and find the literature. Well, but I was wanting to listen to the literature okay. and figure out what am I doing wrong, and then I finally realized that they were wrong. Right. So tell me about your most recent book. It's going to be published like in a week, right? It, it's, it's supposed to come off the presses tomorrow in North Carolina, and then they're going to ship it to the warehouse, and we'll see if it shows up next week. Uh, it's called um, 
immigrants and boomers. And it's about the idea that immigrants are not in isolation from the rest of us. The rest of us being the majority of the voters. I don't know if you know this, but one of the big paradoxes in, and you probably heard this from your professor already, uh, in uh, California, as you have the majority of the population now, is, is minority. It's a majority of minorities, you know, African Americans, Latinos, Asians. And the white population is, is less than half, except when it comes to voting. And in voting, the whites are about 70% of the total. And so there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect there. So I realize that the aging baby boomers are largely white. And we've figured out that there's a big connection that they don't know between them and immigrants and, and youth who, who they don't like. They don't want to vote for them. They don't want to pay taxes for schools for them because they think that they're different. And so the, what although, the although recently uh, we've been able to pass a lot of bonds for school construction and other type of construction. Is that uh, just a recent phenomenon? Uh, it's, it's, it remains to be seen whether that was just a temporary episode or whether it's a trend. I think it's a trend. Uh, it, but it happened after I wrote the book, though. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> Interesting but, problem. It happened last fall, right? right. Well, the book was uh, already sort of done. And it, what do you do then? You know, go back and add a footnote, but they passed some bonds. <laughs> you know? But the idea you're saying is that, a very basic idea, is that um, the voters are still white and old. Then most of the school children are minority, mostly Mexican immigrant. And that we don't find that whites are willing to support taxes to educate Mexican children. Right. Except, let me say that I, I, I did put in the book that it turns out that people without kids who are white, actually a good 40% of them in the surveys are willing to support school bonds. Even though they don't have any kids. Even without kids. So there's a lot of them who are generous. I, some of my readers maybe put that in. But there is a lot of generosity, it's just not enough. I, I think that the bottom line is it's not that they, they hate Mexican kids. It's just that they're really penny pinchers. They're really tight with their money. They, they don't want taxes for anybody. They won't pay money for white homeowners. They don't want to pay for anybody. And what my book argues is they should not be penny wise and pound foolish because if they don't invest in the next generation, there won't be the tax base to support them when they retire. Yeah, but they're planning to move out of the state when they retire. Hmm. Is that true? I don't know. I'm just making that up. Well, that, <laughs> that would mess up my story. <laughs> um, I don't think they're all going to move out of state because... It, I'm kidding. I just, no, but that's a serious question. Um, but the trouble is for older folks in California, where would you move to? But you know what? I think part... Arizona, yeah. Arizona, <laughs> Colorado. No, really. You think There's a lot, a, lot of Arizona, Arizona, a lot of Mexicans in Arizona, too, though. <laughs> well, you have the same issue there, right? Yeah. But I, I think that individuals go through this idea that if they don't pay taxes and they save their money, that they can isolate themselves, protect themselves, whether it's here in L.A., in, on the west side or what have you, yeah. that they're up to their own devices to protect themselves right. and don't have to worry about the public good and yeah. don't have to worry about these things. Right. Well, I think, I think so. Uh, what's different about my argument is it's not about today at all. All the, everything you hear about immigration is at the border today. And I'm saying, let's talk about after the border. What about 10 years from now? What happens then? And 10 years from now, all the baby boomers will be 10 years older. So they can isolate themselves today. Mm -hmm. But in 10 years, they, there has to be replacement workers. When the baby boomers retire, we lose all the, well, a lot of the skilled workers. There's going to be a great job market for you guys, by the way. You're born in a very fortunate time in history. You'll have rapid... Uh, promotions uh, around the time you're 30, because at that point the boomers will be gone, and they're just going to be begging for good middle management talent, and that's that's you folks. Uh, secondly, though, they're going to be like begging for tax dollars because all these old folks re require support, and they're going to want to tax you more to pay for them. Plus, they're going to want you to pay off all the bonds that they pass now because they wouldn't pay the tax dollars up so front. Right. So they wouldn't pay taxes now, but they're going to want more taxes later. Well, they're going to want to pass the buck, basically. That's going to happen. And then the third thing is... These boomers sound really selfish. And here's the third thing where you can really... <laughs> this is where you guys will get good promotions, but where you'll really make out wells in the housing market. Because all these boomers are going to be trying to sell their houses. And who are they going to sell it to? It turns out there's not enough people behind them to buy the houses. This is my clincher, my argument. And everybody cares a lot about their home value, so I argue that you ought to pay more money for students, student support, you got to uh, keep the uh, educational fees down, you got to reduce reliance on student loans so that these students who come out of here or out of UC or out of USC, 
These students won't have um, $100,000 in debt. Why? What's in the boomers' interest? So they can afford to buy the boomers' houses. <laughs> if you have $100,000 in student debt, you can't really buy a house. And if they don't have that, I, my projections show, the boomers aren't going to have buyers, and their prices for their houses go down, which is bad for the boomers, but good for you guys. So how many boomers do you think are going to read your book? Well, I, I don't know yet. <laughs> What's it called? It's called Immigrants and Boomers. I, I, you know, the book is trying to speak to the old folks, but secretly the real mission of the book is to mobilize the youth of America who are getting cheated, because they haven't noticed this yet. The politicians aren't talking about it. But it's, it's, it's a bad situation. The deficit in the, at the federal and state level. And, and a, but there's some advantages for you. You're going to good job promotions, and you're going to be able to buy cheap houses. Not right away, but about 15 years from now. Well, if they're not listening, maybe we can put their books on tape and they can listen to it on their iPod, and then you can, you know, <laughs> find, find it, get to them. I'll podcast it. Yeah, podcast it. E e Eric Avila from uh, UCLA. Uh, popular culture in the age of white flight. Is that something that uh, Dal and Jim were talking about in terms of these demographic shifts, what's happening? And how, how do you interpret all this stuff? Well, <laughs> well, how do you do it in your book? The purpose of the book is to combine two different modes of analysis, historical analysis. I'm a historian first and foremost, and the book I wrote is focused on the post-World War II moment of, of Los Angeles' history, um, between World War II and 1965, roughly. Um, and that... Well, why do you aim in 65? Because of the Watts riots? The Watts riots, yeah. Um, that, I think, is the moment when Los Angeles kind of stepped onto the world stage as a baby global metropolis. Um, world so, hold on, a baby global metropolis. No, yes. that's, now, that's a cool uh, yeah. phrase. Yeah, well, it wasn't New York um, or London or cities that we associate as a global metropolis back then, but World War II, I think, kind of set into motion the mechanisms to make LA a global metropolis that it is now. Today, I don't think we have any question that LA is you know, a world city or a global metropolis or, or, or whatever, and that it is in the company of these you know, mega cities. Um, but in the post-war period, it was uh, ascending to that status because of World War II, because of the Korean War, because of the Vietnam War, um, basically, if you took the continent and tipped it on its southwestern edge, you see this kind of funneling of people, jobs, and most importantly, money, kind of just pouring into the regional economy. A lot of them white people, right? And we're not talking there about well, it. Well, everybody, actually. Yes, yeah, certainly a lot of white people. Um, but that's actually one of the uh, key points of the book, is I, I really try to question this idea of white people. Um, I, I, I what do you mean the idea of white people? They exist. They're here. <laughs> well, they, they exist now in the way that we talk about them. But if you look historically um, at groups of people that we identify as white, they, they weren't white a um, hundred years ago. They were Armenian and Italian and Jewish and German and Irish. Um, and they were ethnic people, like everyone is so, ethnic people. So white is an abstraction, just like Asian. When you talk to, I mean, most Asians don't identify themselves as Asian. They say, no, I'm Chinese or I'm Korean or Latino, that whole concept. No one goes around saying I'm Latino. They say I'm Mexican or I'm Salvadorian. Right. And so no one goes around saying, and in the past, no one used to go around saying I'm white. Right. They say I'm Italian or Irish. It is an abstraction, but it's a concrete abstraction, if that makes any kind of sense at all. Um, That's like way over my head, a concrete abstraction. It's a concrete abstraction because there have been laws and policies designed to create a white identity, um, to create an identity out of non-white people, such as European ethnic immigrant groups. And kind of one of the key premises in my book is that LA is a, a place where that transformation right. happened, where that kind of racial metamorphosis took place. Um, in New York, you know, people talk about Irish, Italian, um, ethnic conflict. They talk about Jews as Jews. Um, and that's not necessarily the case in Los Angeles, where we talk about white people. 
um, as if those prior ethnic distinctions somehow magically disappeared. Um, but one of the points that I try to make in the book is that in the process of coming into contact with people from Mexico, with people from Asia, um, with black people from the American South, those identities, Italian, Jewish, Irish, whatever, uh, dissolved within the regional culture. Um, and, and the book that I wrote kind of looks at that culture um, to demonstrate uh, how that process of racial transformation took place. So I get two points from that when I read your book about that. So white identity develops here in LA more so than other places. I mean, not Italian American or whatever, but literally white, that you're, you don't say I'm Italian American, you say I'm white or I'm, I'm American. And it does so because you're separated almost two or three generations and two migration or immigration steps away from Europe, meaning that many of the whites that came to LA at that time were second, third, fourth, fifth generation European, and they right. lose that identity. And so, and they come into neighborhoods that aren't all Irish or Italian. They come into right. neighborhoods that are completely mixed with different whites. So that's one aspect of it. And then the second of it, they have to begin to um, uh, deal with eth established ethnic groups that are here, blacks, Latinos, Chinese or, or Asians. Right. And so you, you, you get that. But the interesting thing about that to me is the continuing <coughs> Jewish identity, because they are white, but yet they're one of the few white groups that that doesn't happen to when they come to uh, um, LA. Um, Jim just went through the Jewish identity, and there's still somewhat, that you still see that Jewish identity as opposed to a, a white identity. What's the difference there? Well, I think the Jewish population of Los Angeles is very diverse, and I think some Jews are openly Jewish and others are not. Um, because of the just size of the population, um, it varies. But what, what I'm fascinated by um, and what I try to write about in my book is this concept that I actually borrowed from Professor Allen of spatial assimilation. Um, and I think that's a very important idea because I think that in Los Angeles space, and in particularly suburban space, um, is a setting or an environment that allows for the kind of dissolution of those prior ethnic identities that marked different groups of so-called white people from Eastern Europe or Southern Europe. So for example, in a community like Lakewood um, during the 1950s, Lakewood was a community where Jews, Protestants, and Catholics lived side by side in the same neighborhood, and yet it was a neighborhood that was for whites only. Now, how does that happen? How does a group like Jews, who were racially discriminated against in the 19th century um, and 20th century, particularly in cities like New York, how do they find entry into neighborhoods that were reserved for whites only, like Lakewood? Um, and I'm also interested in the actual suburban landscape itself. Um, if you look at Jewish communities in New York, for example, you can see the signs of Jewishness in the landscape, in the signs, um, in the kinds of commercial activity that happen, in the dress, in the language, you can hear it. Um, but in Los Angeles, when you go to suburban communities that are mass produced, like Lakewood, where all the houses look alike, they all have one garage and the white picket fence and a front yard and a backyard, you can't read those signs of ethnic difference anymore. Um, and that's what I think kind of facilitated this process of, well, white racial formation. And I think Lakewood was uh, one of the major developers of Lakewood was Weingart, who was Jewish. Exactly. And very important to us here at LMU, because he gives that, about, that foundation gives us a lot of money for ah, student aid. Wow. So we're very uh, um, uh, aware of that. I know where there are Jewish neighborhoods. Do, are, are there Irish neighborhoods in LA? Uh, I. I don't know. There's uh, an Irish pub where I. <laughs> well, you're, well, uh, okay, this is great. I'm asking the, the one of the foremost professors of geography in LA if there's an Irish community. It starts out with an Irish pub. Well, uh, it's, it's important. It, it, it used to be, it may still be, the center where a lot of illegal Irish immigrants uh, set, come because uh, they can't find what they want in New York, they can't find what they want in London or Dublin, and they're coming here, and, and people like America. They like a certain freedom in America, and this is a place for, to deal with jobs and housing. 
Uh, but when you actually map it, we, we did from the 1980 census, we mapped the percentage Irish, the percentage Yugoslav, all of these white ethnic groups, and you do see patterns, but I don't think the people in those neighborhoods are particularly aware of them. I think it it's showing up as sort of the residue of past neighborhoods, mm -hmm. and there's been a lot of movement in and out of Norwegian neighborhoods and Irish and Italian. So, so well, I, don't think that, I don't think they're historic. Well, uh, what's a historic Irish neighborhood in LA? Well, Lincoln Heights would be. No, that's Mexico. Oh, that's now. Yeah. That's now. Oh, okay. I, in fact, uh, um, I was thinking of um, just uh, Los, Los Feliz, that area, too. Well, that's Mexico now, too. Yeah, yeah, a lot of changes, <laughs> right? Well, let me just interject that you know, Koreatown is a pretty well-known neighborhood. No, that's Mexico now, too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> well, well, it is, George. Well, no, it's, it's, only, it's only about 20%, 25% Asian. Right, right. And so it is 60% Mexican-American. Koreatown is an incredibly fascinating place because the economic space is dominated by Koreans. The, the demographic and social space is dominated by Mexicans. The political space is actually dominated by African Americans. Koreatown is represented at every single level of government by African Americans. And so it, it, to me, that, that, that's a great space where you can see all of these different, uh, not only ethnic groups, but a, 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 the different domination of different groups in different uh, uh, spaces. Well, is there a white neighborhood other than a Jewish neighborhood that you're aware of, or a quote a white neighborhood like Brentwood? Is there like a uh, Irish neighborhood that you know of, or well, Italian? Well, my, my colleague Phil Essington has been trying to map this, and there's a white neighborhood out there close to Ventura. It's way out. Yeah. It's a fine one. It's really white. But that's not a, a that's just white in the sense of white the white identity that developed that Eric talks about. But I'm talking about like an old. Uh, um, Slovak neighborhood or a, you know, anything like that that you're aware of today? Well, you know, Armenians are, are we count them, they're white, right? Well, I would, but I don't know that most whites would. I live in Pasadena, my neighbors across the street are Armenian, and, um... Eric, are Armenians white? <coughs> it, it depends on what they would say themselves, it depends on where they live, it, it, it depends on a variety of factors, but I, I, I kind of riff off this whole growing body of scholarship. Don't, don't tell the students you rip off. The, the, the <laughs> no, I said riff. riff. Oh, 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 riff. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Uh, no, not rip off. <laughs> uh, I draw upon a growing body of scholarship <laughs> that, that looks at the history of so-called white people to show the kind of historical scaffolding behind the construction of that identity. Um, I teach a course on this topic, and you know, one of the questions that I, I, I begin is, you know, have you noticed that when you go to Europe, people don't call themselves white unless they're living in urban centers where there are uh, substantial populations of non-white people from Africa or Asia in particular. Um, but here, the term has a lot of currency um, and a very troubling history in the United States. Um. You know, when I read your book and other stuff about L.A. in the 1950s, has there ever really, I mean, from my perspective, it, it's an amazing generation of, of people who build L.A. in the 50s. That, have there ever, has there ever really been a group of people more successful economically in, 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 in building a middle class and, and what that generation did in terms of building the freeways, the UC system, bringing the Dodgers from, uh, uh, from Brooklyn, et cetera? It's an amazing success story from an economic and an infrastructure perspective? It is an amazing story. Um, I'm not sure that I see it quite in the same way that you phrase it in that question. I don't see, and, and this is to bring Mike Davis into the conversation yet, and, and I don't want this to be a conversation about what we think about Mike Davis. I, I'll let Mike Davis handle that, that question. But um, I don't see a city like Los Angeles, or any city for that matter, built by very powerful people, particularly powerful men. Um, I think that's a, a, a long-standing tradition in urban history and urban studies, that cities are the product of powerful men, developers who have the vision and the capital to build a city out of nowhere. Um, I think to a certain extent that defines the history of LA like it does the history of other cities. Um, but there's also something going down, going on at the ground level, mm -hmm. at the bottom. Um, and so to me, LA is a product of what's going on up here, but also, just as important, also what's going on in the neighborhoods. Immigrant neighborhoods, 
suburban neighborhoods, middle class neighborhoods, and whatnot. Um, I think that there was a very powerful and energetic generation in the post World War II. With a lot of federal dollars and a lot, lot of and luck, and, 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 and you talk about the war effort and all of that. Absolutely. But I, you could also argue, I think, that the late 19th century, early 20th century generation of boosters were equally powerful in their um, um, building of Los Angeles uh, at that time as well. But, I mean, I hate to use this this uh, old model or whatever, but to me it seemed like in the 1950s it trickled down a little bit more in terms of middle class. Not all the way that you're talking about, certainly East L.A., South L.A., but that there was a, a greater building of wealth in the 50s, not only for the top 5%, but for the next 20%. Still, obviously, leaving that, that bottom 50%, but even they, comparatively speaking, that economy that existed in, in the 1950s was very unusual from, from my perspective when you take a look at the history of urban America. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see it dispersed in different cities, but to be, su to be able to sustain it for over 20 years and continue to incorporate people into that, it was, it's an amazing story. It is. And I think your book captures that. I, I don't think it... it, it it, it phrases it the way I, I, I'm doing it, but I think it, it, it certainly tells that, that story. I, I'm, I saved Nick for last only because he's an LMU colleague, and we have to let our, uh, our, our, our um, those who are not fortunate to be at Loyola Marymount University go first. Um, Nick, how do Native Americans fit into Los Angeles? I mean, I, as a matter of fact, it was interesting, and I didn't want to ask the question, but nobody, none of us, ever even mentioned Native Americans in terms of talking about this, and, and, and na not only Native Americans in Los Angeles, but in other urban areas, because the typical image and stereotype of Native Americans is that they're rural and agricultural, not urban. And, and that's exactly where I start, um, and that's what got me interested in thinking about American Indians in cities, and um, the title of my work in progress is Reimagining Indian Country, and the, the main argument is that when we, when we say Indian country, we do tend to think about rural areas, we think about reservations, we think about places like South Dakota, where there, are, where there are large numbers of Indian people, but um, actually the majority of American Indians now live in cities. Um, and the city with the largest American Indian population is in fact Los Angeles. So here's another one. We were giving a list of the largest number of Mexicans outside of Mexico's LA County, the largest number of uh, Koreans, the largest number of Filipinos, the largest number of, you name it, Armenians, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Now we add uh, Native Americans to that, that group as well. Absolutely, um, and in fact, um, Los Angeles is the largest concentrate, the second largest concentration of American Indians in the country, and the, the first is the Navajo Reservation, um, but Los Angeles is the second, and it's most certainly the most diverse um, American Indian community in, in the sense that you have people from all over the country, um, and all over North America, in fact, if we, we think about indigenous people um, coming to live in Los Angeles. So tell us, what, what, how, you, how are you approaching this in your work right now? What, what is the um, main thesis that you're trying to uh, examine? Well, um, m my bigger argument is that we need to think differently about Indian country. We need to reimagine Indian country to include um, the cities of the United States. Um, so, so just beginning there, um, it's a project of, of thinking about how Native people have migrated to um, cities like Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> The, the for how they have formed urban Indian communities, um, and then the continuing relationships as well between cities um, and reservations throughout the country, because Native people, um, like many migrants, don't just give up their ties to rural areas and reservations and homelands, but, but there are new relationships that develop. So are there neighborhoods where Native Americans are concentrated? Well, that, that's, that's one of the, the interesting differences between American Indians and other groups, is that there are neighborhoods where they're concentrated um, um, and ha historically have been concentrated, places like um, Huntington Park, for instance, um, and some of the other southeast industrial communities in Los Angeles. Um, but we don't see this, the kind, same kind of ethnic enclaves as we do with some other types now, of groups. Wh why is that? Well, that, that's something I've, I've actually had trouble explaining. Um, part of it is that there aren't... And we'll ask Jim and, and Dal about that, how to explain, help yeah. us explain that, but go ahead. Um, it, it could be that there, there aren't um, the kind of ethnic businesses that sustain, that often mark mm -hmm. these types of ethnic communities, and that might be a product of the reservation experience when there, there aren't these types of small businesses on the reservation, and they're, so they're not recreated um, in the city. Um, that could be one explanation. Yeah. Oh, I have a superficial one. A lot of them have uh, um, Spanish 
origin last names. It's easier for them to integrate within Mexican or Latino neighborhoods. And, and then in terms of phenotypes, it, it, it's also easier for them to integrate in terms of uh, uh, Mexican neighborhoods. Dal, Jim, what do you think about uh, uh, this? Well, you're right about the names. I think 40% of American Indians in the Southwest are Latino. Um, no, well, well how, how could that be? <laughs> Meaning that they have Latino last names. Well, they, spent, well, they, well, they you know, the thing about American Indians, they've been here a long time, longer than anybody else, and they're very, a very small group, unfortunately, now. And being a small group, they've intermarried a lot. And that, that kind of disperses their, their impact somewhat because it, you can't, it's not visible. And being a small number, it's hard to get a, a community. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, Armenians are like, like 40,000 Armenians in, in Glendale, right? Uh, well, there's not 40,000 American Indians in LA County, I don't think, are there? Do you no. know? Oh, yeah, there's yeah. well over 100,000. Are there really? Yeah, oh, they're all, yeah. they're, there's some of them right here, you know, it's just, it's dispersed. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the main thing, I think, is the size of that and, and <coughs> the intermarriage is sort of dispersed. A couple of points I could just add to this, well, especially in the 1990s, there's been a big migration uh, from uh, southern Mexico and other Indian sections of Mexico and Guatemala uh, into Los Angeles. Some people are working in garment industry, some people construction, uh, San Joaquin Valley or Ventura County mixed tech uh, farm laborers. And so uh, if they're filling out the census form, they may be identifying as Indian, but they're also uh, Latino, many of them, uh, and so these are blurred identities, and I think also we know from demographic analysis that since the 1970s census, a lot of Americans have increasingly identified as American Indian, people who are often on previous censuses white or black or something like that, and so there's a certain a sense of identity with the indigenous people in Mexico that Latinos who are U.S. born may identify with and say, yes, I I'm going to check that on the census data. So Latinos like to think that they're everything, because we check well, white, Hispanic, uh, you know, all at the same time. So, some do. I think a lot of the more educated, younger college students, particularly, and maybe politically active, and identifying with, with people in Mexico who have been oppressed. Uh, um, so I think that's part well, of it. So. Can I ask you yeah. a, a question about just the, the name of the term American Indian? I mean, Native American for a long time was the correct term, and I noticed American Indians are using American Indian. Is that to distinguish them from the Guatemalan Indians, or what is that about? No, no I, I don't think um, Native people ever really liked the term Native American. I think um, it was a term that came into vogue for quite a while, and it's got sometimes a kind of New Age affiliation or a connotation that, that some people don't like. Um, I think Indian has been reclaimed by Native people in the same way that many other words have been reclaimed by certain groups. Um, I think ideally people like to be called by their tribal name even, um, and Indian might be a, another, um, um, another option. Um, some people call themselves Indians but don't want you calling them Indians as well. Um, so, just so him gets, specifically or? Uh, or non-Indians, non, non, non non-Indians more generally. I, so. I just call them sir. So yeah. there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of different opinions about what the, the right word to use is, which of course means there is no right word. I, I tend to stick with American Indian. I think the important thing to, to underscore in that point is the names that we use, the words that we use to describe ourselves and to describe others are fundamentally connected to issues of social, political, and economic power. Um, and I think that's very true of terms like Indian, but also very true of terms like white. Mm -hmm. Eric, how do you describe yourself? Uh, Chicano. Uh, like hardly, nobody does that anymore. Yeah, I, I'm kind of old school, I guess, in that way. <laughs> uh, like, I'm not, I was born in 68, so I don't really identify with, like, the 60s generation. The kind of movie was over, man, by 68. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I kind of grew up, like, in the in the cultural space of the 60s. Um, so, like, were your parents kind of radical, or? No, like, my dad's kind of old lefty, union guy, socialist, and he'll say Chicano. My mom says Hispanic or Mexican-American. Um, one of my grandmothers says white, and the other one says French. <laughs> so, so what, what's going on with your French grandmother? <laughs> you know, I, I don't think my family is any that is any necessarily exceptional within the Latino community. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of schizophrenia among Latinos across borders um, about what they are. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but in some ways, I, I do think that, that Latinos have enacted or have attempted to enact certain patterns that other white ethnic groups have, have uh, enacted by trying to create distance between themselves and African Americans. And I think that's actually very true right now in light of recent conflict between black and Latino youth um, in LA. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like my identity, no, I, I self-consciously say Chicano because I want it to resonate the Chicano social movement in right. the 60s. Right. Uh, Sarah, yes. how, how do you identify yourself? Oh, well, it depends sort of on the weather, I think. Um, but Jewish American. Oh. And, and let me ask you a couple more questions uh, uh, about art. Sure. Okay, I, I, I know nothing about it. But before it. you ask ahead, me, sorry. I actually have a point I'd like to, to make to the audience and also to sort of go back to your point about the 50s as this great sort of success story. Well, in, in a very defined, <laughs> Eric's already corrected <laughs> me on that. Um, well, it's part, of the, this, it's part of the story of the 50s and social struggles in the 50s, but one of the things I like talking about to my students about when we do urban history, when we talk about Los Angeles, is that Los Angeles does have these plethora of ethnic and racial identities, and many which form in different ways here than in other places, particularly the notion of white. And as a Jewish um, American who grew up on the East Coast, it was never in question that I was Jewish, even though I'm ethnically secular and then non-practicing. And once I got to California, I completely lost that and was just suddenly I was white. And I, my Jewishness didn't have the same sort of meaning. So what Eric's talking about is certainly the experience that people can, ex you know, yeah, live where did currently. You move? What, what, what part of town did you move to? Um, I was living in San Diego initially, actually. Oh, well, that happens to everybody in San Diego. <laughs> I moved to like Fairfax or Sherman North or Toluca Lake. But what, one of the but part of this process of whitening people that takes place in Los Angeles, and we can talk about it historically, there's also this kind of effort, I think, through how the city and its commerce are structured to kind of embalm, kind of stick back in history and try and keep things the way they were regarding ethnicity. I can think of different sites where this happens, and it, one of the places that this does happen is in Eric's book when he talks about playing Indian in Disneyland. And so in the 1950s, amid a number of like, social changes, and some of them are progressive, some are not, you have this effort to kind of embalm different groups, kind of freeze them in place. And Los Angeles has a long history of doing this that go back even further. If you think about Olvera Street, right? You know, the old Central Plaza um, has Spanish history, it has Mexican history. The, all the Mexican structures have basically been eradicated. In the 1930s, it becomes this tourist space for Anglos to sort of appreciate Mexicans in their native habitat. And it becomes this absolutely racialized, embalmed sort of space. And if you go to Olivera Street now, it's been absolutely reclaimed by Latinos, and Anglos actually don't really make that much of an appearance there. And there's a third example of this type of embalming and space, um, which is that of Chinatown, and the history of Chinatown in Los Angeles, which has had four incarnations, and three of them are very famous. But one was called China City, and it was actually a Hollywood set that ended up burning in the 1930s. But this sort of effort to try and create a type, an ethnic type, and then freeze it in time and charge people to visit it is a trope and a, and a, of, America, um, of Los Angeles commercial and urban culture. And somehow it ties into these sort of these ethnic fluidities mm -hmm. that we're discussing. But there's also something else at work to do with how the structure of the city works and what are expectations of how people are supposed to be. So. Yeah, I got two questions for you. Then I'm going to have to pass the students to uh, see what questions they have. Yeah, well, one is I, I know very little bit of, about art, but everybody who I think knows about art, and they start talking about LA, they tell me there's an incredible proliferation of art in Los Angeles. Yes. That in 10, 20 years, people are going to look back and they're going to say the late 1990s and the early 2000s. People are going to look at Los Angeles and say this was a whole movement. It was an incredible, and it's going to impact the art community for, for years to come. Do, do you see that? I think it's definitely true. Um, the art schools in Los Angeles are some of the top in the nation, um, such, as, such as Otis Art Institute, the Cal Arts, for example. Um, you have a tremendous, um, it, people are coming to Los Angeles to be artists, which is something we haven't seen since the 19, early 1960s. You, see, you, go the, you go the other way, you go to New York to be an artist, um, and people feel shut out of that, um, out of that art world. So people are coming to, lot, coming to LA. Um, just the, you know, the, the idea that there's a civic culture supporting the arts is helpful. Um, I have you know, a lot of political criticisms of it, but you know, there is the Getty being here and having big programs puts 
Los Angeles on center stage is a major art center. And um, there's a lot of money to be spent on art. And um, you know, the, the sort of the most sort of authentically um, ethnic or youthful or interesting or non-New York or what have you who are working in Los Angeles can find an audience. And so there's an explosion of this stuff right now. And it is the last 20 years. That's when the Museum of Contemporary Art opened in 1986. It's right. literally 20 years. L last year, the Pompidou in, yes. in uh, Paris, mm -hmm. um, after they had done a, a kind of, uh, I think it was Paris, Berlin, then they did Paris, New York, then they did Paris, London. And when they got to the fourth one, they decided to do Paris, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And they had a whole exhibit on LA artists. Yes. Um, but it was, um, Again, I'm like the least artistic guy in the world. It, it was difficult when, I, when you look at the book and go through mm -hmm. the exhibit. Um, while they were, artists were interesting, I, it didn't seem to me that they were covering L.A. It was more like artists from L.A., yeah. but the content was not. That so is a, that's a very important point, and it's, a, it's an important critique of that well, show. Well, I didn't even know I was being a <laughs> critic. So it was like, cool, now I'm an art critic. Um, there are many artists who have dealt with Los Angeles, and um, Wallace Berman, for example, is an artist that some of you may have heard of. He was a beat artist. He came out of the beat scene, um, lived in Venice Beach, and he was killed in the 1970s. Um, but one of the things, and he was, he was Jewish, and he grew up in Boyle Heights, and his art, which is revered and very valuable now, was um, an art that did show the multi-layers of ethnic experience in Los Angeles and didn't really shied away from the suburban, you know, homogenous boxes. So a lot of his work are imitate, uh, will be like m multiple layers of media that are peeled off. And so if you look at some of his paintings, there are these collages that look like you know, like a wall in New York City or a wall in Boyle Heights where you'd have different languages and different posters, you know, advertising, you know, the Jewish delicatessen and the Mexican taqueria. And so there's a sort of sense of a, a very layered city. And this is work that was being done in the mid-1950s. And so at the same time, while you have this sort of whiteness being built in LA and this homogeneity that in some ways is actually being really celebrated, you have artists who are very actively trying to show a different type of city and a different type of urban experience. But it's only been very recently that any of that art is being really celebrated and the work that does get all the attention are mostly the um, the artworks of the pop artists the Ed Ruscha's and the Rosenquists and these type of um, Robert Irwin for example and while I do enjoy a lot of their artwork as well much of what makes them accessible to people is actually less the stuff that they do that's directly related to the city of Los Angeles and more the stuff that's sort of ethereal um, deals with color and, and texture, and is therefore quite removed from any sort of political or historical context. And I think it's very interesting, because if you look back at art that came out of Los Angeles in the turn of the century that was celebrated, it tended to be the, the pretty pictures of trees and beaches and the light, and isn't that lovely? And the, the, but the critical modernism that also coexisted with it, you didn't really get to see. And so the, the, so the Pompidou exhibit, in some ways, while it does have some Berman pieces in it, when you stick it all together and you're not, and you don't know the broader historical context and you haven't dealt with it as a historian, it just kind of runs together as, it, like it could be from anywhere. And that's yeah. something I find unfortunate. And how would LA respond if that exhibit was here? Do you think it'd be popular? Do you think people would go? Oh, I think it'd be a huge success actually <laughs> if it were here because if part of participating in an art world is receiving credit, and, and Los Angeles has had tremendous anxiety for about 120 years about where it fits into a sort of a global art world or a national art world, and currently, LA is very much at the top of it, and so that alone, I think, would attract people, and I would encourage them to go, but I'd like them to go with some sort of education about the city of, of LA. Dr. Marks. How do African Americans fit into the city of Los Angeles? Well, um, I did an analysis of Viragosa's election, because it was he was, had a rematch against Hahn, and it was interesting to see uh, which group was the one that really swung the election for Viragosa the second time. And everybody claimed credit. Uh, Mark Ridley Thomas was really interested on the airplane when he heard about my analysis, because it basically el every group could claim credit. I broke it down in some detail, but basically the African American vote swung so dramatically 
even though they were, what, I think it's 15% of Los Angeles voters, mm -hmm. but they, they, they swung the election substantially for Rio Grosso. Um, Me meaning that in 2001, Latinos have heavily voted for Rio Grosso, and in 2005, they heavily voted for Rio Grosso. And both times, the whites were split. split. So they didn't matter. Right. And in 2001, blacks voted heavily for Han, but in 2005, they voted for Rio Grosso. Right. I'm not he says it better than I do. I'm but I wrote an article about this too. I'm trying to think ahead to where am I going with this. <laughs> I wasn't paying attention to my own, my own point. But, um, <laughs> but what, what that, that only happens to me with my students who don't pay attention I, to my points. I guess what you see is that there's a small percentage of voters that are African American, but we have some very senior political figures. And they will remain as senior figures even if their constituents are no longer African American. They, they're very important politically. Uh, I think it's hard for new uh, African-American leaders to emerge. Mm -hmm. But the old ones can continue on. And this is an example of continuing on. In my book, I talk about Compton, which is an interesting case. And Compton, you know, went from white to black and now more to Latino. It's still all African-American leadership today and will be for another decade or more. Uh, Even like though it's already, Compton's already majority Latino. 65% Latino now, or 60% yeah. Latino now. But they had a white councilwoman who hung on for a long time, and it turned out she didn't retire until 1995. And basically she had no white constituents at all. Her name was Jane Robbins. And so uh, it appears that basically she just served her constituents well, and they kept voting her in, even though she wasn't African American. So I think our African American leaders have a real, history, real future, but the real question is will there be new leaders? And I think it might be harder well, let me ask, ask, get Jim to respond. Yeah, I, I'd like to make a comment, too. Um, maybe your question was in the political context, and because of the, uh, because of the movements of, of people in L.A., we've seen the decline of the black population over a big area, and that's happened in what used to be the suburban ghettos, too. However, when you look at the map in our book, Changing Faces, Changing Places, you'll see that throughout the San Fernando Valley, a black population has come into all sections of the San Fernando Valley. My street is just typical in Northridge. And these are working class and middle class blacks. It's also moving into San Bernardino County, part of the San Gabriel Valley, into Downey, Paramount, oh, a large number of places. So if you're thinking of the old concentrations of what had been the segregated ghettos, those are diminishing very, so uh, very significantly. And so there'll be a lack of political power in these outlying uh, districts, but for the people who are getting into neighborhoods that um, maybe the schools are better and there's l less crime or something like that, uh, from a social and economic point of view, they may be doing a lot better, although the political district is not concentrated for African American leadership. So demographically and statistically, blacks are less segregated today than they were 20 yes, years ago? Yes, very clearly. So, um, in, in terms of, um, I mean, Dr. Marx and I have talked about this, 1992-2006, in, in 1992, the, uh, um, uh, the riots, and then it, it, you, you had a, a mobilization of sorts. And then to some extent, and you know, I've had this discussion, sometimes people don't like me to say this, but it was to some extent the end of black LA in the sense that after all that political power that blacks had and continued to have up to 1992, that nothing came of it, and there's a frustration level, especially symbolized by the beating of Rodney King and, and, and police still, who do that still go free, that all this political power really meant nothing. And, um, and so black LA, especially politically, is probably more powerful, relatively speaking, to the population than anywhere else in urban America, when you take a look at the numbers. Um, no, nowhere else as a percentage of a population do blacks do as well as they do in LA. Really? Yeah. Um, and, and and yet, the the system's still not responsive. And then you come up and you come up to 2006, and you see uh, Mexican immigrants, not necessarily Latinos, but Mexican immigrants also taking to the streets, but in a very different form. Um, that that's uh, a, a lot of. Do you guys see what's the difference between Los Angeles in '92 and Los Angeles in 2006? I mean, clearly the demographics. But what are some other differences that you see in terms of art representation, in terms of uh, any other cultural uh, uh, issues that are manifesting themselves? Eric? Uh, 
as a historian, I, I that's too brief of a time. Well, I mean, ninety two <laughs> and two thousand six. Too recent. I, I, I don't, I don't study those time periods, so I'd be speaking. Like, but you, you lived those time periods. Well, in ninety six, I lived in Berkeley, so um, I wasn't here. Uh, can someone else handle that? And sure. Then we'll we'll the well, 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 let, let me let me try it. Um, Dahl and then Sarah. Ninety two was a depression. Yeah. A deep depression in, in Los Angeles and California. Um, I have a whole <laughs> chapter on it in my book called The Dismal Future. Everything went bad. It actually started up in San Francisco in 1989. In but the not fall. in Berkeley, in San Francisco, though. No, it, it started at the World oh, Series game. A <laughs> <laughs> it started at the World Series game, the third game of the World Series between the San Francisco Giants and the Oakland A's. The Giants were favored that year, but the A's took the first two games of the series. And then it came back to uh, San Francisco, and finally the Giants were going to get their vaunted offense untracked, as they say in sports lingo. Uh, but basically about 30 seconds before they started introducing the lineups before the game, that's when the Loma Prieta earthquake hit. And that was the beginning of the end for, for California for about five years, because we had like a series of, of earthquakes in a row. Then we had fires. So wait, wait, it's the fault of the San Francisco Giants. Well, As a Dodger fan, I totally agree with that. <laughs> you know, the thing that was unfair about it all, if you know anything about baseball, is that they didn't postpone the series for 10 days, which allowed the A's to bring back the same two starting pitchers again. And so they swept the series four straight. That was really unfair. No, that's okay. The Giants lost. I don't care. Even Mark McGuire said they should have postponed the series or canceled the whole thing. But the point is that uh, it was a very ugly period. People's mood was so depressed by the, the earthquakes and the rapid fire. The um, Northridge got clobbered. The Malibu fire, the, the Oakland, uh, Berkeley um, um, tunnel fire. All these bad things happened. And then the, the uh, economy crashed, ironically because of Reagan and uh, his success with fighting the, the Cold War and beating back the Russians. We had a big, uh, civil, a big defense buildup in the industries. And then after the Cold War was over, it all, it all went away, and so we had this big, deep recession. And then house prices collapsed and uh, went down 40% uh, in just uh, four years' time. So in that period in there, uh, then come the L.A. riots in the middle of that. And of course, the African Americans were also on edge because of a case involved in a, a teenage girl and a Korean shopkeeper, mm -hmm. Natasha Harland, or whatever. Right, right. And so they were on edge about that already. Um, Rodney King was from Altadena, not even in the city of L.A., but he got caught by L.A. cops, finally. Uh, but yeah, all these things came together in a, in a period when people were in a very bad mood, and what fits into my book in particular is that immigration had been booming, and illegal immigration, as it was called, was skyrocketing, and they put these signs on the freeways in that period. You know, the, the deer signs, you know, showing people dashing across the freeways like deer. In the East Coast, they had those for deer, not for people. Um, and all this was happening, and people were just in a bad, depressed mood. They weren't charitable towards anything. So I think, and I think if African Americans, African Americans were frustrated, I think others were too. You could have had other kinds of riots too. It just happened, you know, and everybody participated in this riot. It wasn't just African Americans, but more Latinos were arrested, right, than African Americans. Yeah, but it's, I mean, this is a debate I always have when people bring up that statistic. It was two riots in a sense. It was the first two days were African Americans, and then the second, and after that it was Latinos, and the police finally got out there and started arresting when Latinos were rioting. And so, that's if you take a look at the arrests during the first two days, there were none, yeah. basically. And right. so well, that's, that's probably true. My wife always faults me for being out of town during the whole thing. I had a conference to go to. Jim, you probably had to PA in Denver. No, I was here. Oh. I was here. Well, anyhow, I, I, that's, that's my take on, on it being a very bad period. And I think, uh, still today, Angelinos, their mood about lots of things is really reflecting the era. I'm trying to actually get them to forget that era. But that was just a bad period of history. It's done. Now let's try to be optimistic and look forward and stop defending the past. All right. Well, it's 92 were the riots, 93 were the fires, 94 was the earthquake. It was so bad that even the Raiders left town. I mean, that's how bad it, it got in L.A., that they're willing to go to Oakland instead of staying in L.A. Well, since you bring up sports one more time, we... we uh, our, this state won about eight championships in the three big professional sports in the 80s. In the 90s? Not one. Well, I think one, maybe. And then, since 2000, the Lakers are winning again. We had the Anaheim Angels playing against the Giants again in the World Series. So sports, and I can say this here, right? 
the Trojans revived. <laughs> we, even, you know, we were dead. You don't know, in the 1990s, the Trojans were totally in the toilet. Yeah, Everything well, yeah, went I mean, bad. Loyola hasn't lost to USC in football <laughs> in over 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> that is a good record to keep maintaining. What? We don't have a football. Yes, Sarah. Oh. Sarah. Yes. Oh, okay, my turn. Um, actually, I really appreciate your question because it's one that I think about a lot um, in my writing and also when, I, when I'm teaching. And one of the arguments I make in my book at the end of it and also in my classroom is that African Americans fit culturally very prominently into Los Angeles, especially when you think about how the American popular imagination thinks about Los Angeles. And so one of the things that I'd, I'd like to point out is that, you know, Dow laying out this really important econo socioeconomic and historical context for the 1990s, even right before that, actually, in the, in the middle of the 1980s, I argue that Los Angeles emerges as this black trope of American urban unrest in movies, for example, and through the dawn of sort of hip hop culture when it moves westward. And this is something that I find very interesting if you look at American cinema, that if you look at Martin Scorsese films, for example, from the 1970s, the city that represents America and American political anxieties and economic anxieties is New York. And so you see in the 1970s like movies like, um, well, all the Scorsese films, like drawing a total blank. Mean Streets. Mean Streets, um, Serpico, which isn't a Scorsese film, but it's the type of these very gritty 70s cop dramas of, the, of, of that era, Robert De Niro films. And then suddenly, really, and some of you may be um, film majors or uh, study this and can verify this, but in the 1980s, you get films like Colors. And Colors, directed by Dennis Hopper, who actually came out of the, the beat art scene in 1950s Los Angeles, was this radical film. And you know there was a lot of talk about the Crips and the Bloods that suddenly infiltrated an American pop culture language. And so you see this shift starting to happen already in the 1980s. And then, of course, through the 1990s, you know, Los Angeles becomes, when you talk about uh, ghettos, and you talk about gangsters, and you talk about urban street violence, people are talking about Los Angeles. It's, it becomes this cultural trope with a certain type of currency. Um, it's not the first time that Los Angeles has that. It has it also in the 1940s um, with, the, with the zoot suitors and the fuchucos and, that, and, that, and the violence of that period. But for a long time, from the 50s forward, it's actually those anxieties take place in New York culturally, and then they switch back again. And I think it definitely fits into this broader political and socioeconomic context that you've laid out. But culturally, when you talk to your peers on the East Coast, it's, you know, it's hip hop culture and frequently a Los Angeles hip hop culture that they will think about as, rep as actually representing all of LA. <laughs> so, so I think that's part of the story. Questions, comments, suggestions? So, yeah, Charles. Uh, The reason why those are exceptions, yeah. that, that we found they were exceptions? Yeah, the exceptions. Uh, I, I have to think about the Armenian a bit. In the Mexican case, I thought it was pretty easy to understand because there's so many Mexican people that are scattered throughout Southern California, and when new <coughs> migrants come, they will stay close to friends and relatives. So that's uh, why I think the, the pattern that I expected to find from the Chicago model didn't really fit because those friends and relatives are in Rancho Cucamonga, uh, they're in the San Gabriel Valley, they're in Orange County, in many different places. So if we, look, if we map the percentage of immigrants who arrived in the 1990s compared to the total Mexican population, we're not seeing big spatial differences. Mobilization, we were talking about like the mobilization that happened in 06, what happened in 1992. I mean, was there mass mobilization in the 1950s? The, the, I mean, do we recall that? One of the questions I always have regarding mass mobilization is there's a tremendous growth of black elected officials in 1961, 62, 63. Okay? And in trying to explain that, where was the mobilization in LA that led to that? I mean, and historically, I don't, I don't, I don't see it. I, I've been looking for it. 
in, in terms of um, academic work or in interviewing people who were around that era. It, it just, uh, what is the, do we know of any mass mobilization in the 1950s? I, I, I think the 50s were kind of a break in certain political traditions that have been happening in, L, in LA going back to the 1930s. Um, but the 50s, because of uh, HUAC, because of the Red Scare, because of uh, the presence of tell Hollywood. Them, tell them what HUAC is. I mean, oh, I'm sorry. Name. The House Un American Activities Committee that was responsible for finding communist subversives uh, in government, but also. <laughs> Hollywood. Um, in Hollywood and other institutions of, of American society. Um, that moment kind of ended uh, 1930s and 1940s uh, era of kind of multicultural activism in Los Angeles, labor activism in particular, um, that I think saw a resurgence in the 1960s but along different lines, but the 50s kind of interrupted that. So I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not an yeah. expert, but I suspect that, that that kind of mobilization, the, the seeds had already been planted going back to the 30s and the 40s. And then in the 60s, um, I think some real action was taken that led to a new generation of black leadership. So do you see, in terms of the 60s mobilization, the Watts riots in 1992, what, what, are there similarities and, and differences that, in very gen general terms? Jim, do you see, do you see that? I'd have to think about this uh, a little bit. Um, uh, I believe that the sheer factor of violence gives ultimate some degree of political power because it gives attention. Mm -hmm. And so we have to see who pays attention. And in the 1992 riots, a lot of uh, private uh, companies said, yes, we're going to come in, we're going to come in, and, and uh, on Vermont Avenue, we're going to put in a store or a bank. A few of them did. Some of them did. Has there, has there been a... Uh a moment, Nick, in LA's history where American Indians either had a, a mobilization, a march, a, a, a moment that captures their presence here in the city? Um, well, that, that's, that's a really good question because when I think of this idea of mobilization and try to apply it to American Indian communities, I think more about grassroots mobilization. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the history of the American Indian community in LA from the early 20th century, is people coming together to serve the needs of their community. Um, and I think it's, and one thing I've been interested in, in my own work, is what the relationship is between these grassroots groups, um, community organizations, um, uh, social service organizations, um, groups that focus on the cultural needs of a particular ethnic community, um, how, what the relationship is between these grassroots mobilizations and then these larger um, citywide or even national types of mobilizations. So there, there is a, move, a moment really in the late 60s and early 70s when there's a national American Indian activist movement. There's the Red Power Movement, as it's been called. And what happens in LA is that there's this whole long history of grassroots community organizations. And they're poised to, to respond to that movement and participate in that movement. And what they do is they, they take a lot of the ideas from that movement. They take um, um, pride in Indian cultural identity. Um, they take the, the demand for, um, or the um, kind of militancy or, um, in demanding certain services from the federal government, but then they apply it to these very local concerns that they've been working on <coughs> for, for decades and really for, for generations. Um, they, they demand money to serve um, the health needs of American Indians in the city. They, they want uh, funds to have powwow organizations. Um, they want funds for, for health care. Um, but these very local is, concerns. Yeah, is there any one date, like the Chicano Moratorium or the um, you know, famous I Have a Dream speech or something like that that marks uh, uh, American Indian? I'm, I'm not aware of it. I'm just, that's there is, but it's not in L.A. It's in, it's in San Francisco. It's, right, it's the in, occupation. In LA, though, in it's, um, the occupation of Alcatraz in 69 right. was, was really kicked off the Red Power movement. And that's something I argue in my, in my work is that Indians in LA identify with that movement, but they don't see the need for these large scale protests. Mm -hmm. They just, you, they tap into some of the, the ideology, but apply it to very local concerns. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to change subject. I just want to return to the question you had about the difference between 65 and 92. 92. Mm -hmm. The difference between 2006 and 92, I can't really talk about. But the difference between 65 and 92, I think um, there are some really important differences. 
the Watts riots of 65 was one episode of a national pattern of so-called urban race riots. Um, the 92 episode of urban violence was connected to the images of Rodney King mm -hmm. being beaten by the LAPD. In 65, uh, you have to ask why was LA just one example of a national pattern of, of urban violence? And you have to look at historic patterns of urban disinvestment in the inner city, in which the federal government was directing its resources out of the inner city and towards the suburban periphery of cities across the nation, which left these uh, gaps of racial poverty in the inner city. And that's what I think can explain 65. In 92, I think the media had a lot to do with the circulation of that one particular image that generated such an intense reaction mm -hmm. um, that was not a part of a national pattern of urban violence. So I think that there are some important distinctions to be made right. in those two episodes. Right. So in 65, you're, you're talking also in the 60s with Detroit and Absolutely. New York, New York and, and Boston and right. Philadelphia and Chicago. And but, you right. know, that's a really good point that Eric, that, that Eric raises about it importance of this video. Have you all seen this video of Rodney King? Who, show of hands, who's seen it? Zeddy hasn't seen it. Now, I th it's almost like a, uh, the dawning that, that was 15 a, years ago. It's a dawning of a new technical era when, when people had handheld video cams. So somebody leaned out his apartment window and shot that, that video, and then the news media took it and put it on the air, and everybody saw it, and everybody agreed. All the white residents agreed, too, that those cops are guilty. Right. Everybody said they're guilty. And I still remember when they announced the verdict and it, they had Tom Bradley on the air. And Tom Brad Bradley, the mayor, was shaken. He was clearly shaken and distraught that this was the verdict. No, which was not a good sign. Not a good sign, and we all felt that way. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead over here and then. Go ahead. has a very unique racial and ethnic mix that I think is unique to Southern California. And that's, to me, one of the defining characteristics of social life in Southern California. And I think language has a lot to do with the inability of different racial and ethnic groups to come together to have common ground or create common ground um, in terms of you know, mobilizing for uh, economic and political empowerment. That's that's kind of what comes off the top of my mind. I think these guys might know more than 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 I do on that issue. Well, there's a parallel. Um, can I talk about New York at all? Yeah, a little bit. There's a study uh, called Caribbean New York by uh, a sociology professor, Phil Kucinich, and he talks about how all these West Indian nationalities came into New York and they developed a new identity, which is pan-ethnic, West Indian. They could be from different islands, and they all identify with their islands. But there were tiny little nationalities that they could get critical mass politically and, and had more, more weight if they banded together and they had shared festivals and things. Uh, you also saw a similar uh, phenomenon with that, that pan-Asian um, clustering that went on. It was almost an effort to, to, to get airtime, to, to, to get cultural space in, the, in a city like New York where everybody's jockeying for space. So they formed coalitions. Now, the West Indians had English as a common language, and so that made it easy for them to, to do that together. So, uh, in terms of this question, the whites coming to L.A., what was the cultural space that they were trying to create? Because they already, in a sense, dominated the space. Right, but they're so large already. Right. 
Well, in that case, it, that, that wouldn't apply in that scale thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't see it so much of a strategy among white suburbanites or the people who came here in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s. I see the process of assimilation. Many, many of their grandparents had come from Italy or from Poland or someplace and, and lived in the, east, uh, in, in the East. And then they, by the third, second and third generation, they were perfectly fluent in English and they just behaved as they thought of themselves as Americans. But they didn't include blacks in, in that category. But they just weren't strategizing, I believe, any political philosophy. And I, I'd like to make another point. One of the reasons why that has done is that there's been intermarriage between these former separate white ethnic groups, a great degree. So you, know, you have a choice on how, what you identify. Irish, uh, St. Patty's Day, and, and something else, something else. You marry someone. That same process, I believe, is going on especially in Los Angeles, but around the country, with intermarriage between whites and others, between blacks and Latinos, between Chinese and Japanese and whites. And that same process that you described for whites, uh, I will be, I believe, is going on slowly, but it is going on, and intermarriage is an important part of that. Even with African Americans, though, the, the data seems to be pretty consistent. It's only like 5% of blacks out, marry outside the group consistently. So. Well, that's changed over time. The, the number of intermarried uh, uh, African Americans who've married someone outside an, an African American category that, in, that doubled in the 19, between 1990 and 1998. And I have every reason to think it's still going on now, even though the percentage is, is lower. Right. Eric? I, I would agree with that to a certain extent. However, if you look at the long history of racial exclusion in suburban neighborhoods in Southern California. Um, I think redlining and homeowners associations and deed restrictions are a political strategy and an economic strategy. Um, as to whether they are conscious or unconscious strategies, you know, we could talk about that all night. Um, Proposition 14 in, in 1964, Four. I believe, um, to deny uh, housing assistance to underprivileged uh, minority people in, in urban centers of California. Um, I would define all of these as self-conscious political strategies to preserve certain material privileges for either white people or people who could qualify themselves as white to the exclusion of, of people who could not qualify themselves as And you would white. take it to Proposition 13, Proposition Absolutely. 187, et cetera. Um, you know, I like to tell the, the student about deed restrictions. I, I, I live in Westchester. When I bought my house in the deed, it says you cannot sell this house to a Negro, Jew, Japanese, or Mexican. Right. And it's, it, it's in, in, in the deed. And it's actually after Kramer. Uh, uh, it's uh, Shelley B. Kramer. Shelley B. Kramer, yeah. which was in 48, 48, I think. Right. And, but this house was built in 52, and it was still. Yeah, Shelley versus Kramer didn't get to LA until like the 60s or mid 60s, <laughs> I think. Yeah, um, yeah straight back. I'll get you. Go ahead. Yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, Derek Myers, right? Right, Myers, yeah. Myers, yeah. Um, you know, when, when it comes to whether how much taxpayers in this state are willing to pay for education, I really don't think that tax, taxpayers, I've never heard anyone say, you know, I don't like kids, I don't want to throw money at them, blah, 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 I don't want to support the schools. I really feel that the reason why they don't want to spend very much money on education sometimes is because we're being pushed in two directions. you got the Republicans, they're saying, listen, you know, taxes are so high in California, business is going out of state. Um, we don't have gambling in the state, Nevada does, you know, we, we have to compete with East Asia now, we've got a lot of competition here economically. And then, you know, you got the liberals saying, okay, well, we got to throw more, more money in education, that raises taxes, you know what I mean, and that just plays in the Republicans' hands. It's not really a situation where, where people are just really mad at, at kids and, and at minorities and stuff like that. It's, it's just completely uh, uh, economic and almost mathematical in the minds of most voters, and that's where I believe that most baby boomers are coming from when it comes to that issue, in my opinion. Yeah, are voters conscious of what they're doing now? I mean, how can you vote against kids? No, they're not really conscious. They're trying to be prudent and, and, and be frugal. Um, one thing I, I've noticed, I haven't really written about it yet, but I keep noticing it, is that Californians spend more of their income on housing than any other residents of any other state. Because our house prices are so high, and so we don't have, we spend so much on housing, we don't have enough left over to pay taxes. 
So it's an interesting problem here that we've privatized all of our investments, and the taxes are what pays for the community. But we spend all that community money on our own personal houses. Uh, and I don't think they realize what they're doing. But, they, but if you look at the survey data, though, they ask people um, from the Public Policy Institute of California, um, would you be willing to cut back um, services in the following areas? And only a minority is willing to cut back services in anything except for prisons. Even among conservatives, people who say they're conservatives on the survey, only a minority of them are willing to cut back. So that they, everybody wants to have their cake and eat it too, basically. No, but the majority is in favor of those services, but it's just a two-thirds, the overwhelming majority of the race is going to cut it back. Yeah. So that's the problem. Yeah. Well, yeah. Daniel? That's why I called on you, because you had a question. <laughs> Well, both, both of you. It's a great question. It is. Yeah. Social, traditionally, how do we measure social mobility? Well, social well, mobility is, is getting, well, it depends on if it's within one generation or between generations. Um, within one generation, you can't really add, increase your education after age 25. Most people don't. So then we look at social mobility by how much your income goes up and then how you've moved to a, a better house in a better neighborhood. Is that how we so do it? But between generations, between parents and children, we look a lot about how much more educated the next generation is. And that's supposed to then lead to better incomes and better houses. But home ownership is a, is a key indicator of, uh, of mobility. I uh, just going to throw out one number on, on home ownership, just one number. Yeah. And this is the number I, I keep telling the journalists on the East Coast, which is the percentage of Latino immigrants in the first generation who, who lived here who have become homeowners after they've been here for 20 years. And the East Coasters think that they're all at 0% homeownership. Do you know the answer? No, I'm not. Oh, okay. Oh, wait, well, you well, I, haven't, I haven't given you the number yet. It's, I'm going to give you one number. So the percent who become homeowners in California, 52% immigrants after 20 years. But I also want to speak to your point, which is why your question is really so smart, is that this question of geography and where people end up in a city is part of the question of social mobility. So even though certainly, you know, if you're tallying up education level, income, and the fact that one owns a home is certainly be part of that and can be something that can be traced. But one of the things that's really coming on the table today, and certainly clear in Eric's book, that where you are located in the city and where you have choices to go. And so that's, I think that's a very important point, that there's a suburbanization process that's taking place with these groups that we traditionally in American popular culture locates in sort of more crowded urban spaces. And that's very smart. Um, part of the problem then, though, becomes like, are these people part of Los Angeles when they're so far out of what we consider any sort of urban, uh, uh, relegated urban metropolitan area? So, Jim, what do you think? Uh, on the lines of that question and piggybacking on what uh, Sarah was saying, too, the locations, there's a whole group of sociologists from the eastern U.S. who have been measuring for 15 years the uh, upward mobility of immigrants and racial minorities by moving into a high percentage white neighborhood. That, that became their measure. Uh, and what we're finding in California particularly is that people who, whose income allow them to live in a, a middle class area, we, I'm thinking of the East San Gabriel Valley, Hacienda Heights, we have people who are maybe third generation Mexicans living there, middle class, preferring to live among other people of the same ethnic background in an ethnically diverse area. I think the whole notion of measuring whether or not you've made it by getting into a white neighborhood is really out of date for California. Well, far I like because there's no more whites. <laughs> not <Okay. yet. laughs> I, So I, I don't think it's an appropriate thing, and it gets right to that. You can measure it by whether or not you own a home or your income level, so that, those sorts of things. 
So I'm going to get some more questions from the students, but there's two questions I'm going to ask and toward the end, just so you guys could think about it. If you were going to recommend three books on LA to the students, what would those three books be? <laughs> okay. Eric, you can't say your own book. Three times. Yeah, three times. Yeah. Go ahead, right here. Um, so I know, like, when I think about social mobility, we're talking about owning a home, um, that being a sign. And then when I think, when I think social mobility, I also think of civic assimilation. I think of marital assimilation. I think of these different levels of assimilation that accompany social mobility. Um, and what I was wondering is you were saying that you were saying that African Americans in Los Angeles are so socially moving up and moving to these upper class neighborhoods into these Well they're not upper class neighborhoods, they're middle middle class. Suburb, yes. So so they're this emerging black middle class that I'm that speaking of. Um, so why is it that they're not is why is there not such a prospect for new black leaders when when I think of them moving these neighborhoods, owning these homes, I think of them reaching levels of, of civic assimilation into the community. So why is it that they they are reaching these levels uh, of owning a home ownership, but they're not reaching these other levels of assimilation? Because so they're company. Right. I mean, there's still racial polarization in terms of voting, and there aren't enough blacks in, to, in the districts in California are so large that you need, need large numbers. However, you'll still have these cases where you will have African Americans win significant positions with very small black populations. Mayor Bradley in the city of Los Angeles. And even uh, just this past election, there was a um, woman, uh, African American woman from the Inland Valley who won, who won a seat. Uh, and you know, uh, um, Berkeley just elected Dellums, who's African American, and Berkeley's not majority black, even though he's a great leader and an old leader, go, goes to your point. So blacks are dispersing, but they're still small. They're dispersing from South Central LA, but they're still in pockets in Moreno Valley and in Pacoima. And, and so when they move out to the valley, they do end up in, in small pockets. Is that not true? I mean, uh, no, I don't think those yeah. pockets are there. OK, that, oh, that's good to hear. But in terms Dal, you've written about uh, uh, some of the stuff in terms of um, voting. And how would you respond to the question? Well, you know, I don't know how politicians work. You know, they have to develop a constituency. And I suppose something like Barack Obama comes along, and he's going to be elected um, with, you know, primarily a white voting well, base. Which right? is a case in Illinois. Yeah. But, you know. So, but that's, you know, you, it, it comes down to particular personalities who can sort of, you know, override everything else. Whereas the uh, easier route to leadership is if you live in a in a in an enclave where people are like you, and you can be, represent uh, a more defined people. I guess success is not having a defined people anymore. I mean, one thing about the whiteness idea is that, is that these ethnic groups lost their individualism, their distinctiveness. They just sort of m merged into a general middle class. And maybe they were defined more by Republican versus Democrat than they were by ethnicity. And maybe that's where... Well, they were defined by not being Mexican or black. Mm -hmm. but, so is that why well, you're seeing our society is becoming more of a class divided opposed to it? Well, society our society has always been class divided. But I mean, they say that it's becoming more divided by class and by race. And I, I think the two are so fundamentally intertwined throughout American history up to this very moment today uh, that I, I, I always shy away from the class versus race question. Um, but the, but the, the, it's becoming more salient that you can talk a little bit more about it because it's more obvious now when if class is tied to ethnicity. I mean, it's almost death to a politician running nationally or statewide to make class an issue. But there's a sense that you're going to be able to start talking about that, or am I misjudging that? Well, you know, you listen to NPR today and you hear a lot about the death of the middle class, or you watch, who is it, Wolf, Wolfhound Dude on CNN? Uh, Windsor. Windsor. <laughs> Wolfhound Dude? <laughs> I don't know his name. But this whole concept of the death of the middle class, the end of the middle class, um, that to me is a real sign that class is coming back into our language, um, and 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 race, you know, comes and goes as well according to to you know the tide and flow of yeah. politics. Let me get some more questions, but let me first get uh, um, Nick to well, address that. I think the most prominent politician who's talking about class now is actually John Edwards, who was of course the vice presidential candidate, who's now trying to become the Democratic candidate for um, for president, and that that's something I think the Democratic Party has maybe, or at least certain parts of the Democratic Party has tried to do more recently is talk about class um, and talk about um, even working class and middle class as well. Um, 
And I actually want to make another point about African American political power as well. Um, I think maybe the question, you know, who, who is going to be the next black leader to represent the black community is the wrong question. I think it's how are African Americans going to play a role within the multi-ethnic coalitions that are now required to, to assume political power in, in Los Angeles. And, and even those dates that we threw out earlier, 1992 and 2006, are interesting because it's Tom Bradley on one side and it's Antonio Villaraigosa on the other. And these are two politicians who only came to power because of their ability to put together these multi-ethnic coalitions. And um, I think if we look even further back into the history of LA, we can see a number of moments. Um, you know, this is the most ethnically diverse city in the country. Um, we can see these multi-ethnic moments. And as historians, I think it's important that we look back to those and see the possibilities for different ethnic groups coming together. And if we think about political power, um, I think we, we should think more about um, not black political power, or Latino political power, but, but kind of multi-ethnic political power that can offer some different alternatives um, and some different visions of Los mm -hmm. Angeles into the future. But racial voting is still extremely strong mm -hmm. in Los Angeles and responsibility. Okay, who else has got a question? Any, anybody who's got a question, raise your hand. No more questions? Okay, I got a couple of questions. Um, oh, go ahead. Um, this is for Professor Rosenthal. I just had a quick question about um, the future of American Indians residency in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. What do you feel that would most benefit the group? Would it be assimilation into a multi-ethnic, more urban neighborhood, or residential concentrations? And what, where do you feel that it's going? Um, okay, that's a good question. Assimilation, that, that's a term that has, um, that certainly strikes American Indians in a certain way because Native American people have, have faced a long history of efforts by the United States to assimilate them into American culture. Um, and what the history of, I think, Native people in Los Angeles shows is that that was a very kind of wrong-headed and um, unsuccessful project that um, um, in a city, in a city like Los Angeles that has so many different um, influences, um, Native people have moved to the city and maintained and developed a sense of cultural identity as um, not just tribal people, but as um, intertribal people, as American Indians, um, while they've also sought access to um, modern American urban society as well. And I think, I think, it, I think it's that project that, that most interests um, Indian people is to um, remain culturally distinct as a people, but to also be Americans and also um, take part in, in the possibilities of, of living in Los Angeles. But don't you think that it, I, I mean, uh, this is just a hypothesis, that it's going to be more difficult for American Indians to maintain their distinctiveness in Los Angeles than it would be in other areas because of the Mexican population, that they could so, so yeah. more easily integrate because of, for a variety of different reasons that I want to go into. I mean, yeah. that's just a sense that I have, that it's easier for Native Americans in San Francisco or New York to maintain their distinctiveness than it would be in Los Angeles. I, I think you're right, and I think that's been true for over 100 years. Um, when I look at the early 20th century, um, and if you look at census data, census data is really interesting if you look at, um, for a number of reasons, of course, but if you look at some of the, um, the census, the, the ones done by the federal government, um, you can see people who identified as, um, as Mexican or who were identified as Mexican by the mm -hmm. census taker. There was a special census of California Indians done in 1928 to settle land claims. And you can see those same people identifying as Indian on the Indian census, whereas in, um, two years later in 1930, um, you see them um, maybe intermarried, maybe living in a different neighborhood, and they're identified as, as Mexican or even as white. Um, so I think that's one reason Indian people have been overlooked in urban areas, right. um, and especially in Los Angeles. So we, before we get to the point about the three books, Eric, when's the last time you were at Dodger Stadium? Uh, well, I lived basically next door to Dodger Stadium for about five years in Echo Park. So um, I haven't been to a Dodger game probably since I was 12 years old. <laughs> And you, you're right about the uh, Dodger Stadium. And well, I was supposed to be a professional baseball player, not an academic. What happened? 
Uh, well, given my total incompetence in athletics, <laughs> I, I hid and I took refuge in books instead. And, you should have uh, talked about a major injury that it, it, it ruined your career. Yeah, no, I have kind of a sports phobia going back to very strong-willed men in my family. That, uh, <laughs> but when you go to Dodger Stadium today, it, it is, in certain parts, almost 90% Mexican, Mexican-American. I mean, Dodger Stadium is a Latino experience. Yep. When I was growing up in a mostly Mexican neighborhood and I'd go out to the cheap seats, it was almost mostly Mexicans. I had no, I, to me, it was a Mexican experience then. When I could afford a little bit more of the reserve seats, by that time it was, became Mexican. When you look down at the, a typical Dodger game, even the most expensive seats and everything, it's, uh, I would say of the 50,000 people there, at least 30 to 35,000 are Mexican. Yeah, I think this is a, a really interesting thing about contemporary Los Angeles. Um, in my book, I talk a lot about how Dodger Stadium uh, symbolized this kind of new white Los Angeles, particularly in the way that it kind of suburbanized the city center. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that moment, given that you know Dodger Stadium uh, was built on top of an old Mexican-American community, it created a lot of racial tension. Uh, for a long time, a lot of Chicanos, Latinos did not like Dodger Stadium because of that history there. But yeah, now, my, my dad refused to go. He would drop us off. It's not that uncommon. Uh -huh. But but now it's very very different. Now I think uh, Latinos and Mexicans are kind of reclaiming Dodger Stadium <coughs> as their space. Um, I think that had everything to do with Spanish language broadcasts. Fernando of Dodger Valenzuela. Games. Fernando yeah, Valenzuela. Was, well, yeah, how important was that? Oh, it, was huge. Huge. <coughs> it was huge. It was huge. Um, and I think that's a very interesting clue about the Latinoization of urban culture in Southern California. Okay, three books. Two rules, though. You can't say Mike Davis, because I think you're all going to say that. And you well, can't. Then, two and, books. And, no. Uh, okay, because we'll all talk about Mike Davis forever. And you, can, and you can't mention the book of anybody on the panel. So, Jim. Yeah, I would have to think about this. Uh, you teach that, this stuff. You read, you've read every single well, book. Well, I've, I've read a lot of books. I have a lot of them on my shelf. Um, uh, you know, prison. You're drawing a blank. Uh, yes, I'm drawing a blank. Yes, I'm going to ask Christina her three favorite books. Well, to, to, in Jim's defense, I, I could say that um, Nick. LA has only very recently come to be a site for scholarship, um, especially by historians, I would say. Yeah, no, um, that's a very, I mean, it was tough to find books on LA in the yeah. 70s and 80s, yeah. but in, in the 90s. The, the first book that I would say, even before Mike Davis, would be Carrie McWilliams, mm -hmm. um, Southern California, An Island on the Land. Yeah. Um, the second book I would say, maybe even before Mike Davis, would be Day of the Locust by Nathaniel West, which is actually a novel, not a study. Right. But it's a very, very shrewd insight into the culture of the city. And my third choice was Mike Davis, but you took that away from me, so I don't know what I can say. Dal? Um, well, I'm going to really only add one book, because since the books I want to mention, I can't mention, because they're, <laughs> they're on, on the, the, the podium here. But I want to add uh, Bill Deverell, Whitewash the Building, which is a look at how um, uh, the Anglicization of uh, Los Angeles sort of reclaimed the Latino past and remade it in the way that Sarah was talking about is an embalmed uh, representation. So whitewash the building. It just came out last year. Nick? Um, I'd add uh, Matt Garcia's book, A World of Its Own, um, which um, tells a story of a larger history of, or, or a history of Latinos in greater Los Angeles. And I, I think it does a lot of important things. Um, for one, it helps us reconceptualize what LA is, not just as the city of Los Angeles, but a much greater entity. Um, but also, it what that book does is it, it it does something that I think Eric was talking about earlier, which is it, it focuses on the negotiations between um, structures of power in Los Angeles and grassroots <laughs> communities and sees the history of Los Angeles as following from those negotiations um, and not from um, kind of the dictates of, of those great white men in power. Yeah. Sarah. Um, I would add two other books to our list here. Um, one is Josh Side's L.A. City Limits, which is a really excellent history of African-American Los Angeles. And the second book is Don Parsons' Making a Better World. And this is a book coming out of the University of Minnesota 
that um, really casts much needed light on the struggles of the 1950s over public housing. And it's recasting the Chavez Ravine story, but also I think recasts this notion of like the 1950s as this successful moment. That there's tremendous struggles and one of the things that the costs of the economic success of the period was the destruction of what he calls a community modernism, when people imagined what he calls a better world and a place where people shared more. And it's a really a carefully done book, which I highly recommend. Well, hey, let's thank uh, all these great people.